Lewis has just come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Miss Dennis. She was a... Thank <laughs> you. 
to worship this morning. My name is Pastor Sylvia Harris, and as always, it is an honor and a joy to be with you on Sunday. A few announcements this morning. Um, the first one is that our council has approved for the church to hire a part-time secretary. Um, it's likely to be around eight to ten hours a week of work, um, and the days and times are going to be figured out when we have a person willing and capable skilled to do the work. 
Um, so it's a fairly flexible position in that regard. Um, if this is something that perhaps you or someone you know may be interested in, you can either contact myself or I will also say you can contact our SBRC chair, uh, Ms. Camila Windsor, as well. Um, both of our emails and a little bit of information is on the back of the bulletin, so if you have questions, please, please, please reach out, let us know. Um, we're hoping to get somebody hired to help out with some of the administrative work of the church. It would be truly a blessing for all of us. Um, as a reminder, Next week, Miss Agatha Edmund is going to be starting our after worship time of study and fellowship. She's going to lead uh, for both the 19th and the 26th of September. Next month, as I understand it, Mr. Miller is going to lead for the third and fourth Sundays of October. Uh, remember that these are going to be going on for the third and the fourth Sundays. So mark those in your calendar for after church over in the fellowship hall. Um, these are going to be times for learning, deepening our connection with one another, as well as our faith and our journey and walk through life with Christ. So um, if you're interested or you feel called to lead and help out with some of this kind of stuff, I'm going to say please talk to Mr. Miller or Miss Windsor also, because they are the ones who are helping us to organize this time of learning and study. Reminder, if you haven't filled out your attendance card or you didn't get one, I see my Faithful Usher is back there helping us out again this morning. So please make sure you fill that out. If you haven't filled it out before today, please take the time to fill out the full contact information. This is how we are updating our records so that we have accurate reporting of our membership and we have accurate contact information for everybody. So please, at least for your first time, fill out the full contact information. If you filled it out before, you can just put your name down, that's fine. And as a reminder, the back is a place where you can communicate with me directly any prayer requests that you may have, any concerns that you may have, joys that you would like to share. Um, if you want me to call you or contact you this week, you can put that on there. This is a really great way for me to be able to communicate more directly with each and every one of you. Um, I really appreciate those who took the time last week to let me know what I could be praying for in your lives over the course of this week. It, it's something that selfishly I really appreciate. Um, so please take the time to fill that out for all of that. And then finally, I want you all to be aware, um, you know, I have a tendency to be transparent about these things. So I want you to be aware that I am in continuing conversations with our district superintendent and the Strengthening the Black Church Initiative. Uh, they're still, we're still working out how that's gonna all go, but I want you to be assured that I am continuing in that regard to seek intentional revitalization work and partnership here at Wesley. Um, I know that all of you uh, who call this church home have a deep love, a deep care, and a deep calling um, that we continue to be a place for fellowship and a place where people can come together and know the light and the love of Christ. And so please be aware that that is continuing. That is what we are hoping for, what we are planning for. Um, and so I would just ask for you right now to please join me once again in a moment of prayer for the renewal and the revitalization of Wesley. God, who is making all things new, we come before you this day asking that you reveal to us your heart, your will, your purpose for us, the children of Wesley United Methodist Church in Phoenix. Show us the way forward that we may partner with your plans, your purposes, your Holy Spirit in this community of faith. Open our doors that more people may know that we are here. Open our doors that the ones that the world has pushed aside may know that they have a home with us, a safe place, a welcoming place here with us, your children. Lord, we seek growth and a new life, that we may steward the gifts, the graces, the blessings that you have poured out so abundantly among us. Open our eyes that we may see. Open our ears that we may hear. Open our hearts that we may love as you would have us do. All this we pray by the power of your spirit in the name of Jesus the Christ. 
Amen. And now I would invite Ms. Vera Brown to lead us in this morning's call to worship.
we are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Through confirmation and through the reaffirmation of our faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. And so this morning I present to you Michael Harris, who comes to this congregation from Gilbert United Methodist Church. And so now I will ask you, on behalf of the whole church, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they may present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? According to the grace given to you, Will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? And now to you on the top of page 35, my friends. Do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Michael Harris now before you in your care? And now let us join together in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to death, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. And do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Amen. Amen. And now I'm on page 38. Michael, as a member of Christ's Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your to strengthen its ministries. As a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And now to you, members of the household of God, I commend to you, Michael Harris, to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love. We give thanks for all that God has given to you, and we welcome you to the Christian love. As members together with you in the Holy Body of Christ and in this organization of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant and faith in to participate in the ministries of the church, our prayers, our presence, and our gifts, and our service. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Welcome.
Thank you. And now for this morning's scripture reading. Again he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables and in his teaching he said to them, listen, a sower, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, let anyone with ears to hear, listen. When he was alone, those who were around him along with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything comes in parables in order that they may indeed look, but not perceive, and may indeed listen, but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, these are the ones on the path where the word is sown when they hear. Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground when they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. But they have no root and endure only for a while. And then when trouble a persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word and it yields nothing. And these are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30 and 60 and a hundredfold. These are the words of the Lord. And so would you please pray. God of blessings and abundance, we come before you this day asking that the words of my mouth and the meditations of the hearts and minds of all those hearing my voice 
be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone are our source, our strength, and our salvation. Amen. So as promised, we are sticking with the Gospel of Mark for a couple of months here. And this morning's scripture is really the very first long-form parable, if you will, in this gospel. It's contained in all three of the synoptics, um, and it tends to follow the exact same pattern that we just heard read this morning, where there's the parable, the purpose of parables, and then Jesus, Jesus gives somewhat of an explanation for this specific parable. It's interesting to note that the... Um, the only version that the lectionary takes into consideration from this parable um, is the one that comes from the Gospel of Matthew. So what we're reading from this morning is actually not part of the lectionary. It's left out for some reason. Um, Google couldn't tell me why it was left out, so I don't have an answer because Google gives me all of my really good answers in life. Um, so apparently Matthews is the preferred one for those uh, who de design the lectionary. And since I don't like to follow directions, I'm gonna use Mark's, okay? So we're gonna see a little bit today about what Mark has to say when it comes to the parable, what's known as the parable of the sower. Quick lesson before we go much further on the gospels. When we talk about the synoptic gospels, if you've never heard that, that's referring to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They are um, very similar if you read them. Um, the Gospel of John is a very different piece of writing and contains a lot of different content and material. And so the synoptics are those first three. Um, scholars have actually historically really overlooked Mark's Gospel. Um, there's, there's a multitude of reasons for that. Primarily, uh, the two primary reasons are Mark's writing is a very rough Greek. He's not well polished in the original language. Um, and so early on in the history of the church, people looked at it and kind of scoffed and said it, it's kind of a secondhand cousin, if you will. It's second rate. Um, it's not well written. In the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, they have a lot more. It's almost like somebody just took some things that they liked out of Matthew and Luke and made a poor version in Mark. Um, that's what early scholars said, but recent history actually has looked at it a little bit differently and says that Mark is actually most likely the oldest account that we have. It's the oldest gospel um, and that the they had it backwards, basically, and that um, the ones that wrote Matthew and Luke looked to Mark's gospel and then add it to it. And so I think it's really important that we keep that in mind. It may be shorter, it may be rougher, but it's a little bit closer to the original, if you will. Um, it's dated to be written around 65 to 75 Common Era, which actually places it one generation removed, essentially, from the death of Christ. And so whoever Mark is, he may not have been a firsthand witness, but he definitely spoke to those who had firsthand accounts. And I say all of this to also point out that if we date it to those particular years, Mark was writing a gospel during the time of one of the first really intense crises, if you will, in the early church. If you um, aren't familiar with history, Nero was uh, the emperor of Rome, and the, the capital, Rome, the city burned, and he blamed Christians for the burning of the city. And so they were experiencing some extreme persecution, some really tough circumstances, if you will. And so this is the period in which Mark is writing the gospel, okay? He's writing the good news, because that's what gospel means, is good news. He's writing during a time of incredible persecution and um, really tense setting for the early church. And so as we enter into the reading, this morning in the narrative, Mark has just written about Jesus appointing and commissioning the 12 apostles, um, and he's been traveling through Galilee. He's been doing preaching. He's been casting out demons and performing miracles, but he has yet to really teach, okay? He's been doing some incredible things, and now he's going to teach, and he's going to teach using parables, Okay, and so we have this scene set on the seashore, and this crowd is gathered around, 
And the only way that Jesus can teach this huge crowd is to actually go out in a boat and teach from the boat. And that's where he is as he starts to tell the story of the sower. Okay? And, and he's saying, I'm going to teach you in parables. And so the word parable, it literally means in the original language to place alongside. I'm going to place two things alongside of each other so that you can learn. All right? I'm going to put these things next to each other. You're going to be able to compare them, and you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. That's what a parable does. A lot of times parables are used to present what is a well-known thing, but with a twist. Something that like, like you think, oh, I know where this is going, and then you go, where did that come from? That's what Jesus does with these parables. And today's message, today's parable is not really all that different. Jesus teaches about the sower going out to sow, and while he's sowing his seeds, there are some that are falling out along the path and on the rocky ground and among the thorns. The language of the parable with these particular seeds, they are not being intentionally planted in these locations. They are falling out as the sower goes to sow. So it's almost as if there is this overflowing bag of seed or basket being taken out into the field and stuff is falling along as the sower goes. Or perhaps we have a sower who just was not being very careful as they went about their business and so some things are just falling out along the way. Whatever the reason, we have these seeds that are falling along unprepared soil and that are not going to bear fruit. And yet the seed that ends up in the good soil manages to yield a harvest up to a hundredfold. Does it make sense, that whole parable? If we stop at Mark 4, 8, at the end of the parable, right as Jesus says in verse 9, let anyone with ears to hear listen. Would you have understood what you were hearing? Or would you have been like the 12 apostles who, when they were alone with Jesus, were asking him to explain what this parable meant? I'm not sure about y'all, but I'm probably more like the apostles if I stop at that point. I'd be asking a lot of questions, right? First of all, who goes about planting like that? Who goes out? You live in, in an agrarian culture, right? You're, you're dependent on the crops to live year in and year out. And so who's going to be so careless to let precious seeds, life, fall in places that it's not going to produce fruit. Who's going to do that? That makes no sense. And then I'd, I'd, I'd be asking, I don't know, what's going on? Why aren't they germinating? Why aren't they, why aren't they producing crops? Not to mention, how on earth do you ever get a hundredfold from a quarter of the seeds that you plant? Because you got four places seeds are going to, right? Only one of those four places produces a crop, and now you're telling me they produce up to a hundred? Uh -uh, this doesn't make sense. What's going on here? This whole story makes absolutely no sense, right? You may think you know what it means, but I'm going to tell you, I would have had no clue what was going on. I would have been right there with those apostles saying, I'm seeing, I have eyes, but I can't see. I have ears, but I can't hear. Can you please help me out a little bit here, right? And so Jesus goes about quoting from the prophet of Isaiah. He goes, he goes and he quotes actually from um, Isaiah 6 when the prophet is commissioned and God declares that the people will listen and not comprehend. They will look and they will not understand. And what Jesus is saying here is that, look, these parables are going to be like that. These parables, the way I'm going to go about teaching you is going to be like that, where you're going to look and you're not going to understand. You're going to see, but you're not going to comprehend. And so if you can't get this one, you're not going to get what's coming. You're not going to get the rest of it. Parables make what can seem so obvious in so many ways. Planting. It's a pretty basic concept. And yet what is happening here is just not comprehensible. And so Jesus goes about explaining the meaning of this parable. And it all becomes as clear as mud. Right? 
I mean, we learn what the seed is as he's explaining it. The word, or logos in the Greek, the word. The seed that falls on the plat, we learn it doesn't have a chance because the bird, he says, is Satan sweeping in and immediately taking away the word that is sown on the path. The rocky soil is, is those who receive the word with joy but fall away when persecution or trouble arises. They lack roots, and so the sun can scorch them and destroy them easily. The seeds that are sown in the thorns, they hear the word and they begin to grow, but then they are choked out by the troubles and the worries and the cares of the world. Right? And then finally, we know the good, suit, it, the good soil, it produces a miraculous harvest. You know, a 30-fold harvest alone is miraculous, let alone a 60 or 100-fold, excuse me, 60 or 100-fold harvest. So this, this is just incredible what happens in the good soil. This, this all makes perfect sense, right? You guys all know right now exactly who you are in this parable where your life falls in this particular story? Are you the sower? Do you sow the word of God as you go around out in the world? Do you invite others into your faith, into your church? Do you go about your life seeking to set the captives free? Are you the sower? Are you seeking to bring God's kingdom into the world? Do you do the work of planting the seeds of faith? The seeds, you know what they are, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If these are the fruits of the Spirit, as Paul's letter to the Galatians tells us, the fruit of the Spirit, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who believe in Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. So if we are sowers of the word, spreading the gospel message and planting the seeds of God's kingdom for future harvest, these are the seeds we must plant to produce a righteous harvest for the Lord. So I ask again, are you the sower in this parable, my friends? Planting the seeds of God's word in the world around you. Inviting others to be a part of your Christian life. To join you in the fellowship of your Christian home. Are you the sower? Or perhaps are you the hard-trotted path, my friends? where the seed cannot take root because the soil is hardened and unable to receive it. If you're not that path, are you someone who creates that path in someone else's life? Do you walk through your life in a way that hardens someone else's heart, compacting the soil of their soul have you ever thought about the parable in that way? Have you ever considered what you are doing in your life that may harden someone else to receiving the word of God? Stomping as you go through the world so that others end up wounded, harmed, and left with an ugly taste when they think about what you call faith. You may not think that you yourself are the hardened path, susceptible to the schemes of Satan coming in and swooping and not allowing for the word of God to take root in your life. You may not think about it that way. 
But have you ever thought about what you are doing to harden someone else's heart that they may not receive the word of God so there? Or are you the rocky soil, my friends? Do you have a faith that endures for a little while, springing up quickly, but without much root? When there are challenges in life, do you fall away? When, there is no long, when there's a longer drive to church, perhaps, or a longer than normal work week, or possible ridicule from others in this modern world, if you say you are a Christian and you live faithfully, do you decide that in some ways it is just simply easier to fall away from the fellowship that once brought you such joy? We have a lot of choices, I know, between work and worship, between children's activities and worship, between sleeping and worship. We're getting to where it's going to be between football and worship. There's a lot of things vying for our attention that can make it really easy to feel threatened, to feel the scorching heat of the sun when it comes to our faith. So is it easier sometimes to give in to the rockiness, to be the soil that's not quite good, not taking the time and the energy to grow your roots in your faith, and letting you simply fall away without much thought. Have you ever thought, perhaps, you are the rocky soil, my friends? Or maybe the thorny soil? The soil that is plagued with weeds that choke out the life of any fruitful plant that may try growing. Is that you? Do you focus on the word of God growing in your life or on the cares of the world? Are you more concerned with the lure of wealth, financial stability, the desires of the things related to the world? Where is your focus? On growing the weeds of this life and this world or growing the kingdom of God? The Gospel of Matthew tells us this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Is your treasure in the word of God sown into your heart, growing in your soul? Or is your treasure, your focus on the things of this world, thorns that grow up and choke out the harvest of God's kingdom? Have you ever considered if you are the thorny soil Or perhaps you've thought of yourself as the fertile soil. Is your life yielding a miraculous crop for the kingdom of God? Do you show in your life a fruitful harvest of 30, 60, or even a hundredfold? I mean, if we assume that our lives, that who we are as faithful followers of Christ represented in this parable, if we assume that we are the good soil, then we must also assume at a minimum a 30-fold harvest of those fruits of the Spirit. Are you the good soil in this story? If you're the good soil, have you ever stopped to think about the conditions that it takes in your life to be the good soil? 
What does it take to be good soil for planting crops? It takes nutrients, the right amount of oxygen and minerals and other elements like worms and bugs that get in there and aerate the soil, right? We know that there needs to be the right amount of moisture, the right amount of sunlight, all of the right conditions to germinate and grow. It's been a while since I've gardened. I really struggle with gardening here in Arizona. My, my struggles, you know, the heat, the sun, the sandy nature of the earth itself. When I was growing up, there would be years, my uncle is a farmer, and there would be years that he was able to produce really great soybean or alfalfa or hay, corn, depending on the elements and how they were. A family friend farms still today, and I know they have a really specific crop rotation that they do on their fields, even letting them do like the Israelites, even letting them at times lay without being planted. Because the soil needs to be just right to produce the harvest. There are things that the sower, the farmer, can do to help ensure that the fields are ready for the seed, the word, to be planted and take root. And so my friends, if you are the good soil, what are you doing to prepare your heart, your soul, to receive the word of God that has been sown there? Do you practice the spiritual disciplines of your faith to loosen the soil of the path in your life? To get rid of the rocks that challenge so that your roots can grow deep do you pluck out the weeds so that they don't take and strangle the fruit of the harvest in your life? The parable itself does not tell us about spiritual disciplines, but they are implied. If we are the soil receiving God's word as it is sown into our lives, what are we doing to be ready for it? Are we in fellowship with other believers? Are we engaging in the discipline of prayer? Are we spending time in the word of God, reading the Bible and examining its meaning in our lives? If you think that you are the good soil, my friends, and yet you have no spiritual disciplines in your life, I would ask you to reconsider. If you think you are the good soil and you don't have some kind of accountability to other believers, I would ask you to reconsider. If you think you are the good soil and you don't have someone that you are learning from spiritually, I would ask you to reconsider. Yes, I preach here nearly every week, you know that. But even I know that I have to go and listen and learn from other preachers, from other mentors, from other spiritual advisors in my life. The reality is that there is only one who has ever walked this world and had no need of an earthly mentor. And even Jesus Christ engaged in dialogue with other spiritual leaders of his time and went to the Father regularly in prayer and was in fellowship with other believers. And so for us to think that we can be the good soil, the fertile soil that will receive the word of God and produce a bountiful harvest without spiritual disciplines is the very definition of foolish arrogance. So now, my friends, do you know who you are? in the parable. The sower, the path, the rocky soil, the weeds, or the good soil. I will tell you now that we are all the sower. We sow seeds that will bear fruit, my friends. And we are all soil. 
It is a matter of what kind of soil. What is the soil in your heart, in your soul, prepared for? And I promise you, if we live our lives as faithful sowers, sowing the fruit of the Spirit wherever we go, and if we are preparing our hearts and our souls to continually receive the Word of God, I can promise you that we here at Wesley, we will see a harvest of 30, 60, and even a hundredfold. And that is some good news indeed. Amen. And so I ask you, would you please, would you please pray with me? God of the harvest, we come before you this day knowing you have a harvest sown into our lives, into our hearts and souls, and into our community called Wesley. A harvest ready to bear the fruit of a hundredfold. We praise you for the miracle that is being revealed in this, your church. Even still, we confess that we often fail to understand your word, your message in our lives. We read your scriptures but fail to see it anew. We fail to understand your word with fresh perspectives. Forgive us, we pray, for the ways we have stunted your growth, stunted your harvest, stunted your bounty in our lives and in your kingdom. Help us to get out of your way so the miracles you want us to experience can come to fruition. Lord, we know you have plans for us waiting to be revealed, and we are ready to see them, to experience them, to engage with them now. Please make your will known that we may be faithful in our stewardship of your purpose, your plans, your kingdom here on earth. As we gather this morning, Lord, there are those hearing my voice who are struggling with illnesses, with crippling ailments like cancer and heart disease like the ravages of mental illness and the challenges of declining memory. We know you work all things for your good for those who love you, and so we ask for you to work your good, even in these things that are painful. Bring comfort, bring peace, bring mercy and love into those spaces ravaged, ravaged by these illnesses. Gracious creator, there are those hearing my voice who are experiencing loss. Loss through physical death. Loss through physical separation. Loss through challenges of broken relationships. Bring comfort, compassion, understanding, and strength to those people now. Lord, there are those with, with prayers not mentioned weighing on their hearts and minds. We lift those prayers to you both silently and aloud now. Lord Jesus, in your mercy, hear our prayers and grant us peace as we pray together now the prayer that you taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now I would invite Miss Britt Kelly to come forward. Sure, who the author is, but uh, thought it was very appropriate. 
uh, and it's titled Forgive Me Not. Uh, the scripture references Leviticus 19, verse 32. Rise in the presence of the aged, show respect for the elderly, and revere your God. Uh, National Grandparents Day is this month. It's not a really old holiday. And while some of us think Hallmark keeps coming up with these holidays so that they can sell more cards, Grandparents Day was actually the idea of a woman in West Virginia named Marion McQuaid. Uh, she had been working for many years with senior citizens and thought a special day should be set aside to honor them. And she was also qualified for this because she was the mother of 15 and the grandmother of 40. <laughs> not giving her that name. Uh, <laughs> In 1973, the first Grandparents' Day was proclaimed in the state of West Virginia by the governor. In 1978, the United States Congress passed legislation proclaiming the first Sunday after Labor Day as National Grandparents' Day, and President Jimmy Carter signed the proclamation. September was chosen for the holiday to signify the autumn years of life. Now, I'm sure we have quite a few grandparents in the congregation today. So to make it a little different, uh, will the grandparents actually stay seated and everyone who is not a grandparent please stand up? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Bible tells us in Leviticus to rise in the presence of the aged and we are to show respect. So will you please uh, honor the grandparents? By, children were taught to stand with respect when an adult entered the room. We become much more informal in our relationship these days. Maybe that's not been a good thing. In April of 1999, the Forget Me Not flower was adopted as the official flower for Grandparents Day. And that was a great choice. Sometimes when we're young, we don't make time for people older than us. We can forget to go visit Grandma at home or Grandpa in the nursing home. We need to remember to be respectful and to give our time and love to our grandparents. They have contributed so much to our lives and they have so much wisdom to give us. So here's a little forget-me-not flower for you. You may want to give it to one of your grandparents along with a hug, or you may want to take it home and set it somewhere to remind you to take time out for your grandparents and older relatives. I don't want to hijack Grandparents Day, but I do want to share something that um, someone said to me about 20 years ago. <laughs> she shared uh, with us when we were, shared with me when we were doing uh, the youth group. And she had a grandchild with her, her very first grandchild. And she said to me, I knew I could love I love my children, but it wasn't until I had a grandchild that I knew that I could not love as much as I love now. So it stayed with me. I love my grandparents, and I felt the love. So kids. Before I lose it up here.
invite you to please stand now as you are able to join in our closing hymn. I would invite you to stand now as you are able to join us in our closing hymn. Number 310 in your hymnal, He Lives. Ha, 
you just give these to the... You can put them in the plate or... Yeah. You may each have a cheese and not season now. Uh, all right, yeah, I, know, I, know. <laughs> I hope it's the father's season. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. We got to get on next next uh, next yeah. uh, Do you need me? Do you need my help on anything? Anybody? Not really. What do you 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 What I I got some out from there. Okay. If you are going to do some of our power mess, you have to get me up real nasty. You have to come with me. I think so. 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 Take a look, take a look outside. Take a look outside. Take a look for you. What? I said you beat me too. I said you beat me too. I said you beat me too. I beat you too. Oh, I thought you were done. Oh, here. He said you didn't know what to do. Good morning, How are you doing? I'm doing. When you talked to Mr. Mason, remember I told him, he said, he gets in his car, he goes to the Mason's back to Sierra Hill. And I told him, go to the bus stop and order you a car. Tell him to bring you a car. Now I'm going to have to call him and ask him, did you see what I said? Go sit at the bus stop and order you a car. He's going to try. He's going to try. That's not going to happen. Oh, uh-huh.